Okay, so real quick, I want to do a short video going over functions in C. I'm only gonna do one video on functions besides my regular coding session on them, but it's a very, very important topic and ties into a lot of things that go further in programming. And honestly, it's probably one of the most important topics in almost any language is how to break down your functions into more versatile code. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, so functions. Like I said, the goal of functions is to kind of make more versatile code and their main use case is to reduce the amount of redundancy that we have in our code. So they are going to be individual blocks of code and their whole purpose is just to reduce that redundancy so you don't have to rewrite the exact same code every single time you want to do something. You can allocate that to its own function block and call that at any point. Now, to do this, they have arguments that are passing them into parameters for the functions that helps modularize them. So maybe if I want to do searching through an array, I can say, okay, search particular array for a particular value. I can have a function call, so just a funk, and then just maybe like my array, and then val. So these are my arguments and they passed into a function call and should we go we'll pass via a function call into the function should be good now not every function is designed to return data many of them are some are just going to do some specific set of code and that's all they do but many of them the idea is to pass in data process it, and then return some result back. Now, there's two different types. We'll go over those real quick. The first one is the void function, and that's the one that does not return anything back. Now, the whole goal of a void function is just to have a block of code that might get used pretty frequently, but we don't have to do it all the time. We just write that one function and call it anytime we want. We don't care what returns back because it's not going to. That doesn't mean it's not always going to transform data. As you'll notice here, some of the actual uses is just maybe displaying text in the menu that you want to do pretty frequently, or you're dealing with multiple reference variables. And I'll touch on that in a few parts coming soon. So, got some code over here on the right, and just a typical include for the actual input output library. And then we have this block of code right here. So it is a void function called hello. It takes in a character array. You can tell it is an array because of this star. I mean, that it's not guaranteed to be an array. It's a pointer here. I am passing in a character array, which is a string in this case. I'm just passing in a string to the function. But, you know, strings are character arrays, so bear with it. But what we have here is the function just does printf hello percent s for string as is in the recipient parameter right here and then it just prints it out so we're not returning anything back the whole thing is to display some text and we're good so it is modular because it takes in some argument we have a parameter of that character array and it's always going to be passed into the function so here we have the actual function calls two of them calling hello and the first one is passing in a string world so world would get passed from here into recipient, which is then passed into this print statement, and we just print out hello world. And then we do the exact same function call, but we pass in a user instead, and now user is passed into recipient, and then we do hello user. So we do this print f twice. It has a module approach by having a parameter here and we pass in whatever data we want. So again, it just is to reduce the redundancy. I, I could just print out two printfs of hello world and hello user, but this is a very simple example. If I needed to do something more complex, I don't want to do that multiple times, every single time in a row. If I can break it down to a module approach, 
it makes the code much versatile and a lot more readable as well. So beyond that, we have return functions. So those are functions that will be initialized with a specific data type in mind. That data type is what is going to be returned back from the function call when the function ends. It's very important to note that C can only return one item from a function. So if you pass in some data and you want to return multiple values, you're not doing that via a return function. You're gonna to need to do something a bit different, but it is possible to transfer multiple variables in a function, but not by a return function. For these, you specify the data type and then you return one value of that specified data type. So on the right, same setup, we have input output library. We have this block of code for a function up here. And then we have our main function. So when we're doing functions, by the way, I should have mentioned this previous slide, but I forgot. Apologize. We always start here at int main. That is the first part of the code. That's where it starts. And then we start reading each line. So int main, if is odd, is seven. So if seven is odd, it's going to be calling the actual function here. So we're passing in seven to our function. If that's true, then we print the value is odd. Otherwise, print value is even. So we are doing a comparison for this is odd function. This is very similar to the character functions that we looked at in the previous chapter which were the maybe is is upper is lower stuff like that it's just analyzing a single value returning true or false as a result we're just making our own for integers on is odd is even so idea here is we have the function as a data type of int which means we're going to return some integer value from this function so name is odd the parameter here is an integer named value so for what we're doing here is passing in seven into this function for value and we return seven modulo two that's going to be guaranteed to be zero one which we can interpret to be boolean data if it's zero that means it is even which for is odd would be false and if it's an odd value it returns one for the remainder which would be true for is odd so we're just taking the idea of modulo two and using that for our boolean data so is it odd yeah it returned a one from the function so we print out value is odd if i had passed in say six then i would print out value is even because i get zero back from the function so that's about as complex as these should get. Pass in your parameters, do whatever work you need to do, and make sure you return something of the appropriate data type. That's about it. Again, you only get one item out, so just keep that in mind. Now, everything you've seen so far has had the functions at the start. It's above the main function, and the reason is because we need to declare the function first. So, in order to use it, it's declared in the previous ones just by putting the entire function above the main function. However, we can use function prototypes if you would like to put the body or the definition of the function after the main one. So on the right here, we have our declaration slash prototype. So we have integer is odd int value. That line specifies that we're gonna have some function of an energy data type of is odd. Now notice when I do prototypes here, we just do the same thing like we would in the actual function definition, but we close it off with a semicolon. This is the actual prototype. It's telling the compiler, hey, I have a function here, me using it, and then we can use it in the main function and put the actual body of the function behind the main function or beyond it. So same stuff. If is odd seven, 
passing in seven. It's the exact same function from the previous slide. So it's gonna work the exact same way. Only difference here, I put a prototype at the top, put the function body at the bottom. That's about it. So, depending on how some things work, maybe you want the actual body of an entire function after the main function. So if you wanna do that, just use a prototype. No big deal. And then we have a very important idea, which is bring us back to variable scope. We've talked about this previously with loops and whatnot. If statements, it also happens for functions. So you can utilize global variables as a means to have shared variables throughout the entire code base, which is the entire file that you have. And I have one example of a, I have a pretty complex code over here on the right. So I'm gonna try and walk that through. I have a global variable, we have some function variables, so on and so forth. Now, before I move on with globals, they're pretty useful. They have a lot of use cases, but it's generally recommended not to use global variables very frequently because it gets very hard to keep track of them because you can update them at any time. And if you update them when you don't mean to, then you're gonna have a pretty bad day. So it's generally best to keep those at least the uses of them fairly low whenever you're doing any programming. Again, don't just completely abstain from them. I know a lot of people have that sentiment of you should just never use global variables, but they do have some pretty good use cases, but use them in moderation and just be wise when you're using them basically. So, well, any more heartache? Let's take a look at this code here. So I start right off with my global variable, which is a constant double of avo const, which is just the Avogadro constant 6.022 times 10 to the 23. This is in global scope. So I can access this constant anywhere in my code base. And then after that, we have two single line functions. Now, these aren't prototypes. These are the entire function. I just needed a singular line. You can tell my braces are here. Their turn statements here. They are doubles, double A to M, double M to A. They take in double parameters. One is atoms, one is moles, and they return atoms times avoconst or moles times avoconst. So I didn't want to put them in multiple lines because you have to have braces. So I just put them in a singular line up here at the top. And then for one that's going to be a little more complex, I just made a function prototype of it so I can use it in the main function. And I put the body down here at the bottom just so I can read it a little better. So for singular lines, they can go up here at the top. It's not a big deal. If I need to use A to M, M to A, I can do that. The entire function is up here at the top. And I generally like to have the more complex functions beyond the main function if I have a single file. So if it needs to be pretty long, then I just do a prototype at the top and then put the rest of the body after the main function. So since we have the main function here and we have get convert down here, let's take a look at main. Double val, this is going to be a variable in the function scope of the main function. So if I wanted to use this variable, over here and get convert, I cannot do it. It is not within scope. So we have this initialized. Print F, please enter a value to convert. And F and Val. So we're scanning in a double to convert. So we're converting either atoms to moles or moles to atoms using this A2M M2A. So then I have a ah. This is a fairly interesting way to use conditional statements. You can pull functions via a conditional statement. So what I'm doing here is I am setting the value, a new val, so the converted value. So what's gonna happen here is I'm going to pass, I'm gonna print in some number, maybe value five. And I'm going to choose, am I 
Do I have five moles? Do I have five atoms? And I'll convert to whatever the other value type is from there. So I want to get the convert value here. So I am going to call get convert, which is my other function down here, which will give me a one or a zero. So it's Boolean data. I'm choosing other atoms or moles. And then based on the result, I am going to call my function of a to m or m to a for my conditional statement results, which will then give me the converted value. So I'm doing the conversions all in one line with this conditional statement. Now, would I recommend this approach? Generally, no. I'm doing this just to show that it is a way that you can do it, but the readability on this particular line of code is not the best. I can, I think that's pretty obvious just by how long it takes to explain exactly what's happening. I have three function calls and one conditional statement. It's not something I would generally advise. It's something you can do, just not something I would really advise. So, then we just print what the converted value is. Now, when we do this line, first thing that happens, get convert, right? So we're calling this function. So come down here, it is an integer function. Here's my function definition. Again, we have the prototype of the top. So I now have a function scope variable of convert option. Then I have a while loop, and the while loop is here to guarantee that I'm going to get a zero or one as the return from this function. So whenever you have functions that return data, you want to be sure. Like you want to be absolutely certain that whatever you're returning from that function is what is intended to be returned. Because if you return some data that is incorrect, it is very difficult to debug where something went wrong. Especially if you start calling functions from other functions and you start getting nested functions, it gets very messy very quickly. So that's what this function, this while loop in this function is for. It is basically just guaranteeing, hey, if you didn't get a one or a zero from the input from the user, you're not leaving this function. It's going to guarantee that I exit this function with proper data. So that's what it's for. It has convert op not equal to zero and convert op not equal to one. If it's neither of those, I'm staying in this loop. So printf, what we want to convert, zero for moles, one for atoms, and in user input, once I input either a zero or one, it'll exit the loop, return that data to this conditional statement. If I do a zero, I am converting two moles. So I use A to M, and then the moment it does that, it calls this function, passing in the data I scanned in from the user originally, and then converts it, and then returns it back to new val. So again, that's why I said, this is possible, this line is possible. I would not suggest doing it if you have any intention of reading this code ever again or having somebody else read it because conditional statements doing this not not very well advised possible yeah if you and maybe your co-workers understand conditional statements very well maybe it's okay but they do have a lack of readability just by default so when you start making them more convoluted by throwing in function calls it gets a little bit murky so that's why i got to say on that so there's a lot of global scope here function scope so lots of scopes are being worked with this is about as complex of a code base i'm gonna have here so it does cover about everything in functions so okay anyway it does not have the next two things which is the difference between pass by value and we're going to pass by pointers, which is the reference from the way I mentioned earlier. So by default, values are considered pass by value in C. This means copies of variables are created in function scope when a function is called. So updating in the function 
will not update the original value from wherever it was called from. So, what I mean by that is here we have, let me see, we have two variables in global scope. We have hours and minutes. I said using global scope is not always heavily recommended but since we are doing two variables that need to be updated and we're doing pass by value we don't have a choice now my function is convert time it takes in some value in minutes and it gets me the hours of that by dividing it by 60 and gets me the minutes of that by moduling by 60. So i get the remainder wherever I divide by. So if I do 60 here, or no, if I do 62 here, division gives me one, modulo gives me two. So one hour, two minutes. Okay, well, that's good. Hours and minutes are going to be calculated in the function. But if I didn't have this, how do I return that back here? Well, sure, I could make this void an integer, but then I only return one value. I need to update two values. So the way we do that, so let's actually look at the main real quick. Hours equals zero, minutes equals zero, but they are not initialized in global scope, which is good because I can, I have access to those in both functions and I can update those in both functions. So let's see where I go here in a bit. So it initializes zero, enter time in minutes, but enter minutes. And then I pass that into the actual function. I'm going to pass in 79. All right. So 79 is passed in as time value. Hours equals time value divided by 60. That is going to be one. So now hours equals one. This hours up here in global scope is equal to one. And then time value for men is going to be 19. So my global scope is now 19. Okay. And then whenever I print out, because right, I'm going to return back after this line, I return back here. Print F equals percent D hours, percent D minutes. Hours here is 1 because it's a global scope. And minutes here is 19, also it's a global scope. So 1 hour is 19 minutes. So if it was not for those being global scope, I would not be able to adjust those. I need to adjust multiple values. In a single function, I cannot do return function because I want to return one value at a time. And again, this isn't this isn't something I would really recommend. Global scope again is just something that you should try to avoid as much as possible. Again, it's not the worst thing in the world, but for general readability and stability of your program, global scope can be very easy to mess up. The better way of doing this, the more controlled way of doing this, is to do what is known as pass by pointer. And you might see this in other languages like C++ being called pass by reference, but I digress. So, I did not update the text here, but again, like I said, pass by value is the default. When we do pass by pointer, we are, up, we are passing a reference or a pointer to the original data so we are not passing in a copy of the data we are passing in the actual reference to the original data i'll explain what i mean right quick so in this main function now we have time equals zero hours equals zero minutes equals zero these are all in function scope of the main function. There are no global variables here. We do printf, enter time minutes. We enter time. Time's not been adjusted. And then we convert time. So we call our function. Now what we pass in is the actual value in time. I'm gonna pass in um, 192. 192 is being passed into my function. And then I'm passing in a reference to my hours and a reference to my minutes. It gets passed in 
is a pointer to my hours and a pointer to my minutes. So when I update in this function, start for pointers, what's going to happen here is it's going to update the original data. When I do time val divide by 60, I get three. I set hours value equal to three. So it's going to update three in its reference. And then when I do minutes value to modulo 60, I get 12, which again, pointers, reference, updates the original data down here, 12. So equals percent D hours percent D minutes. Hours is three, minutes is 12. But this is the more appropriate way of doing multiple values updated by a single function. It's to do pass by pointer. You might hear it called pass by reference. It's, it's this, this is actually extremely useful and it minimizes the amount that you need to use uh, the global scope. So this keeps things contained very well. The only time that you can update these two func these two variables here is if you pass in references to them. So you don't have to worry about them being touched by any other function or anything else like that. So this is the safest way of doing this. Now, one of the key areas where function shines is whenever you're allowed to separate your code out into multiple files, because everything we've done so far has just been taking all the code, main function, all the new functions, everything, and putting it all in a singular .c file. However, as you can probably tell already, that can get out of hand very quickly because if you need multiple functions, long main function, a lot of things going on, that's going to become a very, very long and complex file. So we can separate those out into as many files as we want. Link them all together and all play nicely just like it was in just a single file. This allows you to have a very, very clean main file because you can allocate as much code out to functions as you want. You can move all the functions into an appropriately named file. But in order to link these all together, we'll need to use what is known as header files. And we've already technically used those when you pass in the string library, the standard input output library, you notice they all end in .h. Those are header files and the standard libraries. So you can pass those in, no problem. They have a collection of functions that we've been using quite a lot, like string copy, string compare, etc., etc. They're all there. We can take use of them and you can do the exact same thing with your own custom written functions quite easily. Now, before I actually show an example of that, I do want to mention the preprocessor, which we've used quite frequently every time we've used include. So in C, the preprocessor is a tool that scans our files looking for any lines that begin with a hash. These lines are not actually parts of our program. So program code is basically anything that the compiler is going to see. The compiler does not see the hash lines. That is for the preprocessor. It directs the preprocessor to, to make modifications to the file. So some of the modifications we've used so far is includes. Other ones have been say like macros and whatnot, or defines, specifically, defines a macro substitution. And then include includes a file and the source program. Now there's a lot of these, quite a lot actually, but we're going to bring in a few more if def, and if, and if in def. Those will be used in our header files. You'll see them right here. But first, let's just take a step back and look at this. We have three files. We have main.c, circle.h, and then circle.c. We know what main.c is. We've been using that the entire time. Maybe they've had some different names here and there, but this is just our main function. It's all it's in. So we have float, 
route, please enter a radius, scans in from the user. We have three variables. One is being called a function get diam, which is diameter, get circ, which is circumference, get area. And then we print out those values. All the work is being done in our other files. So all of our actual functions are located external. So it keeps our main our main main function and our main file very very clean and readable. I'll tell exactly what's going on. But all the work's being done elsewhere. Don't worry about eating up too much space here, getting in the way. But this is kind of what one of the main uses of separating out into multiple files is. Now, let's take a look first at the .h file. The first thing is we have these two up here. If in def circle h underscore h define circle underscore h. This is preprocessor that is trying to define that this is only going to be included in the program once. And you see we have end if here. So everything in this will only exist and can be used once in the code. Otherwise, if you don't have this, things can get messy very quickly. If you happen to have this code duplicated elsewhere, these are just some pre-process directives to try and ensure that circle underscore h is essentially the same thing as circle dot h. It's just making sure this file is only included once. So the only thing that exists, well, this is, you don't have to follow this advice. I generally do suggest this advice as it makes things pretty consistent in my opinion. Some other people defer on this and that's perfectly fine, but this is the way I have it set up. I simply put, my prototypes here. When I'm doing functions and separating out to other files, I do the function prototypes in the header file and any libraries that that set of functions need. So in this case, my diameter, circumference, and area need pi. So I include the math library in circle.h and then I include my function prototypes in circle.h. That way, if I include circle.h in my main function anywhere else, if I want to reuse these files in a different program, it's going to include the math library, include my get diam, circ, and area functions. I can reuse them. And then for circle.h, this includes the function definitions. So see, I have get diam here, get circ just like here. And then get area so here so all of my prototypes and definitions or my declarations are in the header file and then the actual code definitions are also in the header file now notice i do need to include sort of h here so i can include those definition declarations but aside from that i should be pretty good one other note before i move on when we're doing local ones on our own system use quotation marks when you're doing includes the more external ones like with the actual standard library and whatnot you use angle brackets anything you're including directly that you've written use quotation marks okay so and just like this it's uh returning the diameter which is just radius times two or circumference is just pi times radius squared and area is two times pi times radius so they're just single line functions that exist in a separate file. I just did this one because they're pretty short. I can show them all on one slide, but this is just kind of how things are set up. You have your main file over here, your main function. You have your actual function split up into a header file and a .c file. Header file contains the prototypes, decorations, and then the actual .c file contains the function definitions, the actual everything that's gonna be in it. And then you call them all from the main function here. Everything's good to go. Now, to compile these, a little bit different. So everything I've done so far in compilation has been just the compiler. I use Clang, could do DCC, whatever you want. 
I'm doing my LM to actually pull in the math library and then put up a library. And then dot slash main C is you can just do main C. I just do dot slash for current directory. It is taking in the main dot C. This is what we've done so far. Just pass in a single C file, but then I also need to include my circle dot C file. So any dot C file that you need to include for compilation, you need to make sure you pass them into this compile command then you should be good. Now, you do not actually add dot H parameter in the compile command. You don't do that. That is linked together via the includes here. So, got the world header files, just pass in the dot C files for compilation. You should be good. So, that's about what I have for functions. Honestly, there's kind of a lot going on here dealing with the different files, different types of scopes, pass by value and pointer, and then just kind of learning how to use them in general. But overall, they are generally one of the best and most convenient functioning paradigms or programming paradigms are. It's just functions. They're fantastic. They help you reduce the amount of redundancy of the code. They're very, very modular. When you do it with separate files, then if you want to reuse those functions in a different program entirely, you can do that. That's how we do the math library, the string library, all the different standard libraries. They're all just separate functions, not separate functions, they're separate files that contain a plethora of functions that we can include in any program that we want. So if you write something like a library of your own that you like, put them in a header file, .c file, and then just include those in any project we have in the future. And you can very easily do that. So functions are like a staple and code reusability. And that is probably where they're mostly just extremely useful. So that's what I got. Hope this is useful. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next video.